first time Microcosmos is ever performed in its totality. In its totality. And uh, KMA is doing it for the first time in the United States in Miami. So, yeah. Yeah. And we just received notice from him that we can interview him and get to talk to the master himself. So that when we read the email, it was like, whoa, I'm receiving an email from history. This is because <laughs> it's one of those very, um, I don't know, impactful moments. It was, yes. Yeah. Um, but as I, that's kind of tiny, but a few of the things that are listed there also is what this season in itself uh, presents. It's seven world premieres, two US premieres, two Florida premieres, and nine Miami premieres. Um, we are all about bringing the new music to people that would normally not uh, go through the doors and listening to, listen to it. So that's really important part of that. And that's just for this season. I think so far we've accumulated about 30 uh, premieres and I think we counted about 40 something living composers. Mm -hmm. um, so we really try our best to always bring that music to the uh, audiences. So the execution of such a season, um, I don't know how many of you guys are thinking of doing this as a profession or you know just as a side gig, or maybe you will think later on in life, oh, I really want to organize a festival or something like that. Um, of course, this is really the, those you know, streamed down version of it, but definitely planning of it is one of the things. And for us, since the idea of thematic connections is really important, the conceptual planning really takes uh, the first role. So we need to have a thematic umbrella first. And that includes music, meaning the compositions that are chosen, and then the performers, which most of the time we try to think of which performer would be best for which composer. And that's really what assures the greatest performance that we can think of for that particular composition. because. Different composers mean something different to everybody, and finding that connection is really important too. Um, besides the conceptual one, of course, then comes the financial and logistical um, solutions. And in terms of financial, uh, sorry, financial, um, of course, the availability and eligibility of grants is really important. But fundraising is. Uh, insanely important, if grants are important. Um, I think about 90% of income for nonprofits really comes from individuals. And being able to create that kind of bond with people who do believe in your cause is really important. And um, it's not surprising for me to say or for anybody else that comes here to talk to you about nonprofits that that's a challenge. That's the biggest challenge I think you will face. Because you may have the biggest ideas and you may have all these great plans, but if you don't have somebody <coughs> Um, supporting you financially for that, then it's really a big challenge. So um, along the way, you know, you find ways in which you can talk to people and try to create that networking circle around you, but it's, uh, it takes a while to cultivate. So just something to think about if you're aiming for this in the future. And of course, the logistical part is the venues, the booking, rehearsals. Uh, since we always employ multiple performers for one concert, uh, or most of the times we do, because when we have guest performances, one like spotlight on one performer. But when you're dealing with multiple performers, then you're dealing with numerous schedules. And we know how difficult that is with everybody's very busy lifestyles. Um, and of course, the marketing, the design, website posters, programs, all of these great things that um, normally if you had the most amount of budget in the world, you would hire you know, 200 people to do all of that for you. <laughs> but you don't, you know, in general. So you have to really uh, step it up and become uh, the person that wears those multiple hats and really try to learn in the most budget-friendly way how you can do all these things. And nowadays there are so many resources online that you can use. Um, and if in our team, the four core members are basically the ones that are doing a lot of the um, hands-on kind of work. Like Red is our design master and uh, <laughs> master. <laughs> um, and video editing and website. all of that, the website design. So of course, being able to have those resources within the team is very useful because you can get all of that in-kind work yes. that we do very kindly. Um, and of course, in terms of the execution, just making sure you can have the staff and the volunteers <coughs> for each event. Um, the idea that of the building a social media presence, this is one of the things that many of us, I think, maybe as being more shy as musicians at times, we struggle with and just see knowing how much you can sell yourself um, on social media and I think we've had to learn along the way that it's okay to do that as long as it's fitting the image that you're trying to portray. So of course you don't have to, you know, tell everybody, come to my concerts 200 times. 
so that they can just see your posts on Facebook and everywhere else. But uh, I think if you try to tailor the rest of the content that you're doing around the image that you have, whether it's your mission statement in our case, which is you know about cultivating this understanding of music, new music and classical music in a broader sense, then you really try to put together all the information around that context, content. Uh, so in terms of uh, helpful skills, and this is what we have found along the way, and it's something also that does not ever end, and we're always learning, and it's really important to stay in touch with other colleagues of yours that have other professions, I think. Um, a lot of the time we're surrounded by musicians because we love that, and you're musicians yourselves. But then when you start, I think you were mentioning when you, you open up the, you know, like the leadership, pro leadership program that you were talking about, when you start talking to other people and you see how they do things, it's, it's really eye-opening because mm -hmm. there's a, a different mentality and a different way of thinking. Um, so a few uh, aspects that we have learned along the way and we're still working on is public speaking. Not always very clear <laughs> what I'm saying, but I'm <laughs> trying here. Um, so of course, learning how to distill the information. I think a big part of it is learning um, how to target your audience when you're talking to them. And uh, in this case, it really has to do a lot with the fundraising aspect that I was talking about earlier too, because knowing who you're talking to could help you in knowing what to tell them. So a lot of those aspects come together and public speaking ends up being this, you know, web uh, spider's net kind of thing, of trying to figure out what you're saying and if it's being effective or not. Uh, writing, this is a big part of it because we all come from academic backgrounds yes. and having to, not unlearn, but having to shift your thinking from academic writing to something that needs to be more marketable uh, and in the aspect of grant writing to be really succinct with your description and why those people need to give you the money that they need to give you to um, organize these concerts, all of that comes with, uh, I guess, with the, the job in a way, and you learn as you go. Um, we've been very lucky in Miami because the, the local grants that they have, um, the Miami Dade Department of Cultural Affairs, they do this whole uh, step process where you submit it first, they give you feedback, they tell you what needs to improve from there, and what was unclear, what the panel is looking for. So we've learned a lot when it comes to how to properly tailor this material for grant writing, thanks to them. Um, so I'm sure that all, I hope that all different uh, states and counties have similar opportunities. And that's something to always look out for if you're going into the arts presenting um, field at all. Like I said earlier with the design, so just you know, learning how to use those multiple skills. Um, and this adjusting to the social media language, I think was in line with uh, the public speaking in the sense of having, <coughs> knowing how to tailor the information and um, your speech to the different types of um, audiences. So like we were saying, yes, you need to be many people all at once. And it's very different, I think, from what it used to be even 50 years ago, 40 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, being a musician nowadays. Because uh, you cannot only rely on the management uh, companies. You cannot only rely on competitions. And there's so many of us graduating all at the same time and going into the world all at the same time. So just finding ways in which you can make your voice heard and stay true to what you believe is important for yourself and for your art form. That's the thing, because also with management nowadays when you uh, win a competition per se, it doesn't mean it really sticks with uh, everything you would love to do. Uh, is a different goal probably. So uh, we really wanted uh, this mission to happen and continuously to, to be present where we are. So you got to be the manager also. Uh, yes, well, <laughs> an educator, of course. I think if you do music, you love to share your love for music. So like Fabiana was mentioning earlier that we teach at their academy and you know, we teach uh, various other private students. And of course, at some point in life, I think we would all like to teach in a uh, higher education system. Mm -hmm. That's what you train for and you love to do that because I think as performers or musicians of any kind, you're always learning. So it's like educator and student all in the same pot in a way. Um, and then of course, you have to organize things because sometimes if you don't, nobody else will. So it's always good to <coughs> kind of ascribe to that motto, you want to, you want to do something right, do it yourself. Um, and be able to do that and do it in such a way that it's not uh, you know, taking a toll on your life. 
Um, and of course, if you're doing all these great things, you want to be able to also promote all the great things you're doing. So again, learning how to deliver the message. Um, in terms of tips and suggestions, we already kind of went through with that, but but uh, so I would wrap it up. Uh, not to miss any opportunity right now. Uh, we we forget how much information is available for us and how much we can learn, not just from the class, but at the library you are at, at the online databases your uh, library has. Personally, when I was a student at the University of Miami, our library had so many databases about grants, about uh, opportunities, how you could find fund uh, your projects uh, to perform somewhere. So take advantage of that. And also, those databases have links that you could learn uh, online courses for free how to become a video editor, how if you want to create a documentary, now, nowadays uh, things are so much available for you. And I'm pretty sure that uh, University of North Texas has softwares available that students can download for free and use them for their own creative projects. So do take advantage of that and, and be open to new ideas. Uh, one thing I learned myself uh, is that I, needed to take that uh, that hat of being shy to mm -hmm. just speak my voice and uh, there is uh, just to think that there is no wrong always will be learning things so and uh, as I said with the with the example of George that you never know who listens to you there will be somebody that connects with your ideas and you will never know where that leads most of the time it can be uh, something very positive when you have an idea that you really want that idea to succeed. So. Yes, and together with that, I think also <coughs> the idea of being open to criticism and suggestions, there will always be that, and I think you find a healthy way to deal with it. Um, it's <coughs> very useful as you move on in this whole process of being a musician out there in the world. Um, I think since we're so self-critical towards what we do, a lot of the time we take mistakes very much to heart, but if you take them just as a learning opportunity and then just go back outside, out there and do it again and then just learn from the process, that's very important. And of course, above all, try to enjoy it and have a lot of coffee. And if you're yeah. not a coffee person, have a lot of tea. Yeah. <laughs> you will need it to stay up with the all extra hours that one needs to survive. Well, thank um, you. Thank you. about five minutes left and some students have submitted some questions ahead of time so we want to make sure we take some time to go over those so maybe you can ask who's here from those students yes. make sure they're here so they can hear. Uh, so, uh, I have one from Calandra, Elena, Tommy and Pedro. Okay. Um, Calandra I'm going to skip yours because I yeah. feel like that was yeah. the Yeah. Um, this one. Elena I'm going to ask your question. On your website I noticed an art gallery page featuring multiple paintings. Do you incorporate paintings and other forms of artwork into your musical performances? Yes. Uh, that's yeah. a very good question, yes. Uh -huh. That art gallery actually has not been uh, updated uh, as much as we would want it to. Um, one of our board members is a painter also himself, um, and we have incorporated paintings in our uh, performances in the past. Not every performance has incorporated that, but we have incorporated poetry other times when we haven't incorporated paintings. Um, the last concert that they mentioned. Yeah, the last know, concert, uh, Gaia, uh, <coughs> for, uh, of last season, uh, we, we had the art uh, projected from the art of Sebastian Sprang, uh, a local artist in Miami, and we did the nature pieces by Morton Feldman to, uh, to be projected together with the performance of that so but more of those are coming at the next season but we don't want to spoil that uh, okay all right this one is from tommy how will you ensure that new works are performed after and beyond kaleidoscope muse art concerts yeah that's the hope the hope is that what we do will inspire more people to do the same um, like Betty said, that the uh, works by the women composers that were chosen throughout our call for scores, they were performed in our concert season, but also the performer that learns that work, they would like to take it elsewhere too. 
So already is playing uh, Na Hyun Kim's composition, for example, in about three or four other concerts, yes. besides the one in Miami. Um, we've had a few of our colleagues who were very much, you know, traditional music, play my Rachmaninoff, play my Chopin kind of person, uh, and they, we asked them to play something different and something new, and I think they just fell in love with the process and completely not knowing that they were uh, going to, and they started doing those things also in their program, started featuring more new music, so that's the, the hope. The hope Another is example is too. the music of George Walker, but that, uh, I, I know it from... Uh, personal connections that uh, students are currently learning more of his piano sonatas. So, the, in a way, it's already happening. Uh, this is from Pedro. <coughs> what was the inspiration for the organization's name? Oh, uh, we were talking coffee. over... Coffee. Coffee, <laughs> <laughs> well, something else, a little stronger than coffee. But we were just talking with our team and the idea was uh, like we said earlier, that is this music that seems unrelated initially, and then there's all these connecting threads to it. So we went over a few different <coughs> words in terms of uh, what can be one thing that is seen from multiple angles, and then it changes and it shifts forms. And that's how the whole word kaleidoscope came. And I know that there's a lot of kaleidoscope things out mm -hmm. there. Um, I, ours was kaleidoscope news art exactly for the purpose of involving more of the other art forms uh, that we hope to feature even more in the future. Very good. Very good. Anyone has one last question? We have like a couple of minutes left. So if anyone wants to ask something, this is the time. I have, oh, oh, Daniel. Yes. How did you guys go about actually putting the team together that was like kind of unified that was in the show and whatnot? That is unified then what? Sorry. Yeah, that was actually unique mission and things like that. How would we go about that if you were to start something from scratch, you mean? Putting a team together. Yeah. Putting a team together. I think for us, we were very lucky because we all very, we are all very good friends, and we all shared a similar vision when it came to what when it came to what we wanted to do with classical music. Um, I think surround yourself with people that share your your beliefs in a way. And if you do that, and you're all working towards the same goal, there will be a point when everybody's like, okay, this is what I want to do. Also, um, I think what is difficult is after that trying to get other people that are not really part of the the main yeah. team to get to believe in that too and become part of it so that it keeps growing. But the, the you know, small team, I think you can do it if you really just, you know. I think with, uh, let's say the connection with Maria, Maria Sumareva was, uh, I always, I, I, I just like to perform new music. So I always end up with uh, discussions about it. So that already, that open, openness to discuss that, that, that already invited some other people to to share the same opinion. So uh, let's say uh, the pianist Maria Sumareva was already connected with the ideas she had similar with me or I had with her. So it, it can start just by that. And then the other connection uh, would be when you have this small team and does the concert, you have the example again of George. He is the other connection afterwards that is created because he, when you put it into practice, maybe some other people will end up liking it and then another discussion gets uh, evolves and uh, so that's how it is so far. Yeah. Well, thank you very much to the two of you. It's been a pleasure having you. Thank you. Thank you.